Good morning everyone, it's 11.30 on my watch so we might make a start today. Thank you for tuning in as we cover the OSROAD Safe System Assessment Framework. And before we begin today's presentation, we'll just run through a few housekeeping items for those of you joining us for the first time. My name is Angela Ratz and I am the online training coordinator here at ARB. Today I'll be providing uh, moderator services and technical support should you need it. Hopefully everything will go off without a hitch though. Today's session is approximately 45 minutes in duration. We are, of course, available for hour. If our wonderful audience are full of questions, we'll aim to get through as many of those as possible. Please be aware, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a very large audience with us today. So if by any chance we don't get to your question today, please feel free to touch base with us after the webinar and we'll, uh, we'll assist in any way that we possibly can. Today's session will also be recorded and sent to everyone via email. Now, webinars work best when they're interactive, so I will uh, draw your attention to your control panel and a few of the features are featured there on your screen. So please don't hesitate to send us your feedback, your thoughts, your comments or questions at any stage of the presentation. We'll receive those at our end and I will pass those on to our presenters to discuss uh, at the scheduled discussion times. Now, our presenters. Mr. Blair Turner and Mr. Chris Urowicz of ARB Group. Welcome to the webinar studio and thank you for your time in putting together today's material and um, for your time to present it. Welcome. Thank you, Angela. Thank you very much. Now, I very much look forward to hearing more about this report, which I believe you have both had a very pivotal role in putting together. Is that right? That's right, yes. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Blair Turner, joined by my colleague uh, Chris uh, Urowicz. Uh, and we were both uh, authors from this uh, report from Ostroads, and I'll, I'll point towards the document uh, and where you can obtain this towards the end of the presentation. Uh, but also joined uh, in the development by uh, our colleagues in the University of Adelaide, Jeremy Woolley, uh, and uh, Dr. Bruce Corbin as well. So quite a large team involved um, along with the working group to develop this, this new bit of work. Okay. So look, I'll just quickly give you an overview of what we're going to discuss today in the session. Um, I'll give you a very brief recap on the safe system approach. Um, there's a bit of assumed knowledge here. Um, we'll talk mainly though about the, the need for this assessment framework and how to actually uh, use it. Um, I will, will, Chris will certainly uh, step you through a case study uh, and just show you how this could be applied uh, and a bit more detail around its application. And then we'll finish up in terms of where we go next with this new tool. Um, and throughout we'll certainly have a chance to take questions, comments, and hopefully at the end as well, some chance for some discussion as well. So I mentioned uh, that there's a case study, so it will be quite theoretical uh, for the first part of this presentation, but just to give you a bit of advanced warning that there will be a, a case study which brings us all together. Uh, it's from a, a, a high-speed environment, an uncontrolled intersection on your screen now, uh, and we'll use this in, as an example and step you through the assessment framework, uh, which looks uh, something like this. Hopefully you can see on your screens here the actual framework itself. So it's just a little bit of a, a, a preempting the, uh, the content of, of the presentation. What I want to do first, though, is just to really uh, remind people about the safe system approach uh, and, uh, like I say, a recap on, on this rather than a detailed um, uh, coverage. The report itself certainly does include a lot of detail around where we stand in terms of the safe system uh, and particularly relating to safe system infrastructure. So some of the key points, uh, firstly, uh, it's um, a, a number of pillars within the safe system, uh, and we typically talk about uh, safe roads, safe road users, uh, safe vehicles, and safe speeds as the cornerstones of the safe system approach. Uh, and the diagram you can see on your screen, the round one there, comes from uh, one of the uh, state-based strategies, and you can see there quite clearly they are the, the key pillars um, typically used um, when discussing the safe system approach. The bottom graphic here though shows the, uh, the international context and this is the uh, global action plan that relates to the safe system approach and they include a, uh, a different pillar, they include uh, post-crash care and there's certainly uh, a movement towards um, this extra pillar as part of understanding the safe system approach. Uh, we need to also consider our, our colleagues uh, from the medical uh, professions and getting uh, a quick response time when, uh, when a crash does occur. So the first element really is this uh, uh, range of pillars, uh, all of which work together to produce what's ultimately a, a safe system. 
And by safe system, we're talking here about the eventual uh, elimination of, of death and serious injury. The second key element is the awareness that there's a shared responsibility. Uh, and previously, we considered, um, and you know, I guess we re recognised that a large number of the crashes occur based on human error. Uh, and you'll see the research around on this indicating perhaps up to 90% of uh, all crashes caused by some form of human error. And that's in the past often been an excuse to, to blame the, the driver and then to, to perhaps walk away from our responsibilities as, as road managers. And so I guess one of the changes under a safe system approach is this recognition that we have, uh, all of us uh, have a, a shared responsibility to improve road safety. And, and the graphic here is a really good example to my mind of, of, of what I mean here. Uh, you see, hopefully, um, uh, some audio tactile edge lines here. Uh, and if you think of the example of a fatigue-based crash, uh, and this is really uh, perhaps a human error or a human issue. Um, someone's perhaps uh, been driving for, for far too long or didn't sleep well the night before. Uh, and often, uh, previously with fatigue, we, we would have said this is a human issue and we need to change driver behaviour to address this. But under this shared responsibility, we recognise uh, as road managers there are things we can also do to address this problem type. We can install uh, a, a more enhanced uh, signing, uh, we can put in place rest areas, we can put in place these audio tactile edge lines to alert people when they do leave the road, uh, and we can also put in place um, enhanced roadside infrastructure to protect road users so they don't actually strike uh, roads and objects. So the key point here is we all can have a, a role in terms of improving safety, no matter what the initial cause was. Another element in terms of this uh, safe system approach is the recognition around the human tolerances. Uh, and this sort of diagram has been around for quite a long time now. We know based on research um, the rough impact speeds at which um, we can survive uh, a collision. And above these speeds, the chance of death and serious injury increases dramatically. And so, as the example uh, here for, uh, for pedestrians, if we're at quite low speeds and an impact uh, occurs below around 30 kilometres per hour, in broad terms, our chance of survival is reasonably good. But once we uh, reach speeds above that uh, critical value, the chances of death and serious injury um, increase dramatically. And so we know from the research um, the impact speeds relating to pedestrians, relating to side impacts, uh, for instance, at intersections, uh, and for head-on crashes. And so for intersections, uh, tolerances are around that 50k impact speed, uh, and for head-on crashes in the most modern of vehicles, uh, vehicles of equal mass, if we have a head-on crash around 70k per hour each of those vehicles, the chance of survival uh, is, is reasonable. Above that speed, it certainly decreases dramatically. So understanding those tolerances is really important in terms of the provision of infrastructure uh, and the provision of safe speed uh, environments for our road users. The last point there is this issue around uh, safe system infrastructure, and it really draws back on that shared responsibility element, that there are things we can do as road managers in terms of the infrastructure to, uh, to dramatically reduce and hopefully eventually eliminate death and serious injury. And these images show some of the examples uh, that we know bring about very good re uh, returns in terms of uh, investments in road safety. So things like wire rope barriers, edge and centre line, uh, raised platforms at intersections uh, and for pedestrians, uh, and roundabouts. And the example of roundabouts, we know from the research that uh, for a, a high-speed environment, installation of a well-designed roundabout can reduce uh, deaths by around 80%. So this uh, really uh, is based on our, our research and our improved knowledge around effectiveness of, of road infrastructure. So. That's the background very briefly to the safe system approach. The question then is why do we need to have an assessment framework? And certainly the safe system uh, has been around for a long time. Uh, it's part of our national strategy. And in terms of the National Road Safety Strategy Action Plan, item number one is to ensure that all new road projects consider safe system principles. And we've started to do that, but um, the, the uh, assessment framework really is a structured approach uh, to take that assessment and, and to understand the implications in terms of the uh, chance of death and serious injury. The second point there is, though, that we've had safe systems in Australia now for more than 10 years. Uh, and although there's a really good understanding of the, the vision itself and the need to work towards elimination of death and serious injury, We've found that uh, there's less knowledge and less understanding around the steps to actually get there. How do we actually go about, in a stepwise fashion, uh, movement in, in this direction? 
Uh, and so that's what this framework really is about, to help better understand the risks, but also to better understand the, the solutions to get us towards those safe system outcomes. And so this project from Ostroads was uh, developed uh, with three key uh, objectives in mind, uh, and they are the three on the screen there, to develop an assessment framework to help road agencies to consider safe system objectives, uh, and primarily in their road infrastructure uh, projects. Uh, to assess how closely these designs and, and operation align with those uh, objectives, uh, and then to help clarify which elements need to be improved to, to move towards a safer environment type. So that was really our starting point in this, in this project. So look, I'll, I'll pause there and uh, see if there's any questions uh, at this stage in, in terms of the webinar. Great start. Thanks so much, Blair. I will leave it open at the moment to take a few more questions in case uh, anything is on anyone's mind that they'd like to share with us. We have had a comment come through from Jiri, um, and they're saying, yes, Swedish Vision Zero as well as Australian Safe System are very well known in theory, but rarely in practice. Smiley face. So, yeah. yeah. It looked dead, dead right. And that's really where our thinking started, that um, you know, the vision is clear. Uh, but how on earth do we get there? I mean, we're talking about those infrastructure treatments I showed you, which uh, can be quite high cost. Um, you know, what's that timing here? Are we talking, you know, one year, five year, 20 years, 50 years? So it's really these sorts of issues that we need to bed down further and get a better understanding. And I think, um, as you'll see from this uh, framework, it really is about breaking the problem down into smaller bite-sized chunks to actually help us address uh, the key risks uh, and help us identify the appropriate solutions to, to move towards that end objective. Yeah, I would, I would like to add to that as well that, in fact, we are already doing quite a few things that are um, safe system aligned and uh, this will help us to measure that and put things in a, in a correct hierarchy or order. These are the sort of things that engineers really respond to quite well. Great, thank you for that. Uh, another comment or question has come through here from Jeremy and the question reads, are there any obligations upon road authorities to assess road designs before construction? Yeah, look, a good question, and certainly that uh, legal obligation uh, does uh, vary based on uh, state-based um, uh, policy and, and legal frameworks. But essentially, I think the answer to that is yes, we need to understand the risks on a network. Um, I think we need to then put in place a process to actually address those risks. And one of the big barriers we have is, in all cases, we're short on funding. We can't address all of these problems, um, and you know, I'm sure we would like to, but in every case, we have to uh, prioritise our response. So I think the key things here are understanding the risks and then putting in place a process to help prioritise our response. And it may be we're short on funding and we can't get to um, you know, anything more than our top one or two issues in any one year, but so long as we've got in place that um, uh, appropriate uh, risk assessment process, I think we're covered in terms of our, our, our liability on these sorts of issues. That's good. No, nothing more to add on that. Okay, fantastic. All right, do we have time for one more quick question or shall we move on and uh, take it a little bit later? We've got one from uh, Paul there that's come through. Um, I think quickly. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you for your question, Paul. Um, and the question reads, uh, what's the advice given in Australia with respect to design speed for different road classes? Yeah, very good question. And this is really um, getting to the heart of the safe system and the link between speeds and design. Uh, and certainly there is a growing awareness and knowledge base around appropriate uh, design speeds. One thing perhaps we've missed in terms of road safety is sort of the level of service type approach where um, you know, we need to recognise that there's going to be a, a top end of our hierarchy where uh, we want um, you know, mobility as a, as a, um, a major objective, uh, quick movement of freight uh, and of, of people. Uh, and you know, already we have infrastructure in place, we have the motorway freeway network to try and uh, cater for that. Uh, at the other end of that spectrum, we've got our local roads and our more pedestrianised areas. Uh, the vulnerable road users uh, have perhaps predominance there and, and lower speed environments. We still get in trouble, though, in that middle ground where the, the, the use is actually quite varied. Uh, maybe by time of day it might change, uh, by day of week. Um, but certainly there is a mixture of road users and uh, there's a lot of work going on in that space right now to try and understand more uh, the relationship between things like design uh, and speeds and safety outcomes. So perhaps one to watch the space a little bit on. Yeah, uh, a straight answer to this is that it's typically um, design speed is the speed limit plus 10. In some jurisdictions, in some uh, circumstances, it is just speed limit. Um, 
as Blair explained, we really are trying to converge on the appropriate infrastructure, appropriate use, appropriate function, and appropriate speed. And, and really, this is the journey along uh, towards safe system. Um, probably beyond the scope of this um, workshop to dwell on that too much, but um, uh, there will be uh, probably will be further workshops on this. Absolutely. Along. Yeah, if there's demand, let us know and we'll... Yeah. Uh, and look, I'll, I'll add to that in a moment. You, you'll see a little bit about this relationship between uh, speed and infrastructure particularly. I think this is a really critical element from the safe system approach. Uh, so hopefully some of this will come a bit clearer as we get into the, into the detail. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you to those of you who have sent uh, questions and comments through. Please do keep them coming. And uh, we might move on to the next stage of the presentation. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Angela. Okay, so what's all this about? So the Safe System Assessment Framework, we've seen there's a, a need to get perhaps into more detail. Uh, and so our starting point really was uh, through literature review, uh, consultation both nationally and internationally uh, and workshops, uh, to just uh, really look at what the requirements really were. Uh, look at the intended use of this framework and, and the end users. Uh, and initially, as I said, the starting point really was uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, safe road infrastructure particularly. But it may also be applied, as we found out, to more policy-related issues uh, and even to perhaps some of the road user or vehicle-related approaches that might be taken. But certainly the intended users initially was road agency staff uh, and, and practitioners who support them. The other thing that became clear early on was the need to include all pillars uh, of the safe system. And previously, we've uh, had a very strong focus on the two pillars uh, of the safer roads and speeds uh, coming at it from the infrastructure perspective. We've had consideration, of course, of the road users uh, and, to a lesser extent, uh, the vehicles. Uh, and probably more often than not, no consideration of the, uh, the post-crash care element. Uh, but the, uh, the, the findings from our bit of work uh, that led to this framework were that we needed to include uh, understanding of all of these different pillars because we can actually influence uh, others who have a direct control on some of these other issues um, potentially through what we do. The other uh, key element to this framework was the need to break down the problem into base elements. And we know again from research what our key crash types are and it's things like runoff road crashes, head-on crashes, intersection crashes, pedestrians, uh, increased journey cyclists and motorcyclists. So it's about understanding the key crash types that lead to fatal and serious injuries. Uh, we can throw, uh, based on recent research, uh, rear end crashes in there as well. Now the other element uh, was the need to break down our risk into base elements. And this will be probably familiar to most people, that risks uh, are comprised of uh, exposure, uh, how many vehicles, for instance, are on the road or exposed to a risk, uh, the likelihood of a crash occurring, uh, and then the severity outcomes once a crash does occur. Uh, and I'll pass this over to Chris shortly to explain that in, in more detail. And so when we break it down into these base elements of crash types and key risks, uh, we're left with, um, I guess, a finer uh, grain uh, of, of issues for us to try and work through and, and uh, rectify the safety issues. And so this forms a way for us to assess uh, the risk, uh, to assess how close we might come to safe system objectives. The other element, though, which we'll touch on is uh, we need to have a way to actually improve uh, what we're doing. Uh, and so we've developed, and you'll see shortly, a, a hierarchy of treatment options. And it's typical that uh, previously we would have seen perhaps a crash at an intersection, and a first choice option was to throw in a, a warning sign. Uh, but we know this will have a, um, a very minor impact in terms of the uh, safety outcomes. Uh, we really need to turn this around and say, look, have we got an opportunity here to put in place some of those more substantial uh, safety improvements, like a roundabout? And in many cases, we won't. Uh, but at least we need to consider those high-end options before we uh, jump straight to those uh, cheaper options. Uh, not to say there's no place for those cheaper options, it's more about our, our process to um, uh, determine what's most appropriate. So just uh, quickly, the framework itself, this is the overview of it, uh, and I'll pass in a moment to Chris just to, to step us through these elements. Uh, but different phases in terms of the approach. Firstly, we need to understand what our objectives are. What are we trying to do here when we're um, assessing a project? Uh, is it an infrastructure project? Is it a, a black spot? Is it a route? Um, so really understand the purpose of what we're trying to achieve. Are we looking at different options for solutions, or are we just trying to see if it meets uh, safe system objectives? Uh, what is the scale of the project? Uh, again, is it a, a black spot, a curve on a road, or is it uh, a route or an area? Uh, and then thirdly, the depth of uh, investigation required. And maybe we're talking here about a fairly low-cost um, 
uh, context, not much budget, and so just a half an hour assessment required, right through to perhaps a billion dollar project where we need a large team of people and perhaps a bit more of an objective assessment undertaken. So that's more about the, uh, the objectives of the, uh, the, the project we're looking at. Uh, then we need to understand more about the project context. Uh, so again, these project objectives, what we're trying to achieve. But this next point comes back to the, the, the question earlier about the road function, uh, the relationship between speed and, uh, and design, for instance. Uh, will this be a, a high-speed environment, um, motorway-type environment, uh, or is it a mixed-use function, or is it a local road uh, where we've got lots of um, uh, pedestrians and, and uh, vulnerable road users? As a, uh, and then, so obviously linked to that is what's the speed environment uh, that we have now, or that perhaps we're aiming towards. And that rolls into the issues around uh, what road users uh, are present or should be present in this environment, um, what vehicle types are present, is there heavy vehicles, uh, is, is there other specialist uh, vehicle types in involved. The real core of this framework though is uh, that the safe system matrix, which we'll show you shortly, uh, and this breaks the, uh, the problem down into its base elements like I mentioned earlier. So things like exposure, likelihood, severity, uh, those key crash types, uh, but also making sure we consider the other safe system pillars. Um, as a road engineer, uh, overseas infrastructure, what can we do to help influence perhaps things like enforcement? Uh, or if it's fatigue, what can we do to perhaps influence um, uh, rest area provision if it's a, a very large project? And then lastly, uh, the treatments that might be available to us to actually address the problem. And we'll talk in a moment about uh, primary treatments or transformational treatments that take us in a, a large step towards safe system outcomes. But there's also other treatments that are less beneficial that um, give us a stepwise improvement. And then what are the other considerations, again, around things like enforcement or uh, other behavioural or vehicle-based initiatives? So that's sort of the overview of, uh, of, a, of a process. Uh, I'll pass over to Chris now just to step us through some of the detail around this. Thank you. Um, so I, I'll first of all briefly uh, talk about the logic of uh, the assessment framework. Um, this came out of a number of years of uh, risk assessment research and work that we've been doing at ARB. And essentially, it's, it's a sort of modified risk assessment process where we're uh, not just looking at uh, likelihood and severity, but also looking at road user exposure. So starting from the top, um, the crash severity has traditionally been the, the key concern in safe system uh, discussion, particularly here in, in Australia. It's the first place where you can do some real good and reduce the uh, severity of crashes, which are inevitable and, and will always uh, occur due to human error. Um, so it's about the probability uh, of, of that a crash will result in fatal and serious injuries. The next area um, of attention is the crash likelihood. <clears throat> so this is basically the probability of an event, of a crash event occurring. And this is uh, where traditionally most of the traffic engineering has focused its attention. So things like you know, signs, line marking, fairly low cost things, or some of them um, higher cost. A lot of the road design is also uh, related to uh, keeping people on the road and stopping from crashing into each other. So this is the, um, the area, area of likelihood. We can do a lot of good there as well. The final one is the road exposure. And this is one area where we probably uh, traditionally don't have too many engineering interventions. But there are, and it's really uh, re related to who is using the road and in what numbers. So this is the area where we look at the number of uh, cars, the ADT, the, the number of cyclists, pedestrians, are starting to look at also the quality, of the, the type of topology of the road users, so elderly, children, etc. Um, this is an area where engineering treatments are, tend not, not to have a huge impact, however, we need to recognize that, that a lot of transport planning uh, interventions do. So things like mode uh, shift um, and also uh, like urban planning uh, interventions will have a significant um, impact on exposure. So the safe system matrix follows this logic, as you can see. Um, We've split this into the key uh, fatal and serious injury crash areas, and thus you have a, a two-dimensional matrix. Each cell of the matrix uh, looks at the, the broad 
factors that uh, are associated with exposure, likelihood, and severity. So if we take uh, the top left uh, cell, um, the sort of exposure uh, factors that are associated with runoff road crashes would be ADT, length of the road seg segment. Um, moving down towards likelihood will be uh, factors related to uh, vehicle speed or traffic speeds, geometry, shoulders, presence or lack of barriers, the uh, uh, offset to hazards, the clear zones, guidance and delineation. Finally, the uh, factors that are most related to severity outcomes would be, again, speed. And the, harder, the faster you go, the harder you crash, that principle. The roadside features um, and th their design. So what sort of roadside hazards we have and how forgiving they are. This is where uh, most uh, of the work with barriers and, and things like that has um, has come into it. Uh, for those who may not be familiar, uh, the ADT stands for uh, Average Annual Daily Traffic. Just throw, throw that in. No, thank you. We did receive a few questions on that note. Okay. So thanks for clarifying, Chris, and yeah. uh, hopefully we've um, helped people understand that a little better. Exactly. So it's basically the, uh, the number of cars using the road uh, at a particular point where the project is. Um, the <clears throat> as you can see, this logic is repeated across other uh, crash types. Uh, you know, for, for pedestrians uh, and, and more vulnerable road users, this is a little bit different, of course. We're starting to look at pedestrian numbers crossing, um, also the width of crossing, uh, length of road segment. These are all exposure-related uh, factors, and a lot, of this, um, a lot of these factors come from research. Actually, all of them come from research that we've done over the last 15 years or so. Uh, many uh, uh, statistical models have been developed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> Okay, I'll probably uh, move along to the next one. So, <clears throat> the additional uh, pillars of, of the matrix are the road user considerations. So, um, again, engineers being focused on infrastructure typically have in the past overlooked some of these things, and, and it's really important to bring it back into the assessment, even if it is uh, qualitative. Uh, we need to document these things. Excuse me. <coughs> Beg your pardon. Mm -hmm. and, um, and actually uh, consider that in, in the assessment. So, for example, the uh, level of alertness and uh, compliance of road users need to be noted. Um, you know, are, are there any special road users? There may be things to do with, uh, with the precinct, uh, there may be entertainment uh, activities occurring, or sports precincts, uh, etc. These things really need to be noted and documented on, uh, on, for each project as part of the assessment. Then we uh, move on to the vehicles. Again, we have often assumed that vehicles are whatever, whatever is there, whatever the road carries, but we really need to consider this uh, as the, um, the makeup of the, tra of the fleet of that particular, for that project will have an effect on on some of the solutions we may use. So most commonly we would look at uh, things like heavy vehicles. What is the percentage of heavy vehicles? Is this a particularly uh, heavy vehicle route or, or are they very much uh, in a minority? Um, motorcyclists, particularly uh, recreational motorcycling is, is, a, is a big safety problem in, in Australia. This is where people um, who do not normally motorcycle go to certain parts of the road network on the weekends to um, let's just say w work out some of their uh, frustrations on, and and um, <laughs> <laughs> and they uh, put themselves in in high risk situations on roads which are generally not very good. Um, so these are the sort of things that need to be taken into consideration. Uh, post crash care. Now, emergency access is very important. Uh, p parts of the road network, by their design, would have this uh, problem um, in. In, in really, you know, it's a really big consideration. For example, uh, many urban freeways have no longer uh, stopping uh, like shoulders and, and stopping lanes um, on the roadsides that have been taken up by uh, due to uh, congestion. Uh, so we need to look at what other alternatives for emergency access we have. Um, do we have emergency stopping bays, for example, and so on. So these are the, the sort of um, things that need to be really considered and noted for each project which is being assessed with the framework. So the framework itself, um, 
the approach that we've taken is um, it's really qualitative, but we've added a quantitative um, aspect to it just to help to weigh things a little bit. As you can see at the top of this slide, um, every cell is scored out of four, and each crash type out of 64. Um, those can be added to a maximum of 448, but I would always try to stress that really each crash needs to be considered on their own, each, each crash type. So um, as we work uh, through each, um, uh, each cell, you can give a score of zero, which basically means the issue is not relevant, there is no risk factors there, up to four, which means that it's at its fullest um, weight. And you can work through th that way. The form also has comments for the other pillars, and we'll demonstrate how this is applied uh, on the case study. Okay, the scoring system, like I said, is qualitative. Um, we given some guidance in uh, the report, in the Ostrads report. It's reasonably clear. Uh, it's open to perhaps personal uh, interpretation, and for this reason, it's best that the framework is applied by, uh, by, by a team. If you have a number of colleagues or you put together a uh, sort of assessment team, it's best to discuss and come to some agreement uh, on each uh, score. Um, I'll probably uh, refer that detail to uh, uh, both to the uh, report and also to the case study that we'll use. Okay. Now, uh, as Blair explained, uh, the treatment hierarchy was created to assist uh, practitioners to uh, come up with the uh, the sort of treatments that can address identified safe system risks. It can also be used in order to score um, the, um, the existing risks when you applying the um, the framework in the baseline condition. So it can be used to inform some of the scoring from zero to four. Um, in here you can see a number of different typical treatments. They're fairly broad and how they stand in terms of the alignment. Now, um, alignment with safe system principles. Now, this is uh, something that has been worked, uh, worked out through consensus with the experts involved in the, um, in the project, but it's also heavily informed by the various literature reviews and, and analysis that have been done over the last, say, 10 to 15 years. Um, this part of uh, assessment and in terms of effectiveness of various treatments in addressing fatal and serious injury crashes is an area that is still developing. Uh, there, there isn't the full set of evidence that we would like, but we're moving towards it. So in time, maybe some of these things will move a notch up and notch down, but I think it's generally uh, in, in the correct order. So now we have time for questions. So, well, we'll leave it open to receive questions from our audience. And uh, I just wanted to throw in at this stage because we did have a few questions relating to the presentation material. We will be sending out all of uh, today's presentation material as well as the recording of the session to everyone that's joined us today. So please do keep an eye on your email for that. Uh, we've had a question come through um, and it reads, can infrastructure have an influence on human behaviour? So that did come through a little bit uh, earlier when you touched on that, Blair. Yeah, it certainly can. And I gave the example before about um, the fatigue issue, that if there was a fatigue crash, um, usually you know, thought of as a behavioural sort of uh, issue. Um, but we can put in place um, responses that address the behaviour issues. We can you know, perhaps advertise or educate the public around the need to rest and um, you know, adequate stops during journeys. But certainly uh, in terms of infrastructure, we can uh, put in place uh, rest areas. We can put in place signage to indicate uh, opportunities for resting. Uh, we can enhance the uh, signage uh, and warnings in areas we know that perhaps are prone to fatigue. 
Uh, and then we can also do things to stop people leaving the road, like those audio tactile edge lines. Uh, and then finally, if they do leave the road, we can put in place the roadside protection uh, barrier systems and the like. Um, so if they do leave the road, they won't end up uh, being killed or seriously injured. And I think, um, to my mind, there's probably uh, an infrastructure solution to uh, al almost every single crash type, whether it be started by um, a, a behavioural issue or, or not. And there's a good bit of research around on this which uh, shows that, yes, although crashes uh, typically are uh, uh, relating to human error, in terms of the severity outcomes, we know that by and large the uh, infrastructure has the biggest in influence in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the severity of the outcome itself. So, um, yeah, in al almost all cases we can do something in terms of infrastructure improvements to address what's fundamentally a, a behavioural issue. Thank you for that, Blair, and I hope uh, we've answered your question, Rosie, so thank you for sending that through. A uh, question here from Partha, and um, I guess it, it relates to um, engineer or some engineers um, liking applying design standards which have little or no consideration of safe system speed and um, how we can sort of do better to adopt safe system speed. Excellent. Uh, I think I can perhaps uh, talk about this a little bit more. So um, that is definitely a work in progress. Uh, we've got a couple of projects, uh, some recently completed, some still underway, research projects which are looking at uh, developing some safe system aligned um, design. So particularly uh, looking at intersection designs, this is one area where it is absolutely uh, pivotal. The, um, as you saw, the, uh, the sort of uh, thresholds for su surviving a, an impact uh, um, uh, between two vehicles is, is pretty low, it's much lower to what we allow on the network. So what we're trying to do is uh, look at uh, lessons developed from runabout designs and try to apply them to other uh, road inter uh, intersection designs, things like um, maybe signalised uh, runabouts or, or different sort of innovative alternative forms. Also vertical uh, displacement, so um, Raised stop bars are becoming uh, uh, becoming more popular. Uh, there, there have been some trials uh, in Australia, quite successful, and also they're applied in Holland quite a lot. So this is where you have uh, a raised platform on the approach to a signalised intersection, or you have a raised intersection uh, at all. So basically, this this is about speed control on approaches. Um, there are many, many different uh, ways. Uh, for example, uh, red light speed cameras are, are a great sort of uh, supporting uh, tool in this. They reduce the speeds um, uh, to, to a legal level. Um, so the design is developing. Um, I think also we're looking at uh, a lot more urban planning uh, type of considerations and, and a changing culture. Uh, among uh, designers, engineers, and also the public. So, r raising um, a consciousness that uh, perhaps inner city roads are, are never going to be uh, operating at very high speeds anyway because of uh, sort of semi permanent state of congestion, and then designing them appropriately for that. So, this is the, the mixed use materials uh, that can be designed uh, to match, to support, and accommodate much lower speeds. Uh, in an effective manner. I'll just add to that in terms of the design uh, and I think it's important to realise that design guides already include a lot of safe system content. Mm. Uh, yes, we do need to include um, you know, uh, uh, more evidence as this emerges, but I'll take the example of uh, intersection design and we know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, roundabouts are, are a very effective uh, treatment uh, and the, the design guidance, guidance around how to uh, design good roundabouts is already there. Perhaps what's missing really is more at that policy level that uh, we need to, uh, in the case of roundabouts, decide to use more roundabouts uh, and to reassess when they could be applied. So just be careful we, uh, you don't wait for a change in, in design guides because this will take quite a long time. Often it's a policy decision that needs to be made about what sort of a treatment would be used. And another example of that is, is uh, roadside barriers. We know that this is a highly effective treatment, but perhaps it's more of a policy decision that we're going to use more of these. So just uh, like I say, don't wait until the design guides change because the information actually already exists uh, in many of those guides. That is a very good point, yes. Fantastic. All right, I might just take one more question here from uh, Neil, and Neil was asking, um, has there been any evidence found relating to why centre line reducing operating speed? Uh, good uh, comment. Line. Yeah, wide centre lines, um, a little bit of research, uh, and 
certainly there is a linkage. Uh, when you couple the wide centre lines, perhaps of lower speed limit, uh, we certainly do see evidence that there is uh, a lower uh, operating speed of vehicles. Uh, on their own, there's a bit of research around road widths and speeds, and yes, we do get a slight reduction, uh, but it, it is only slight. Uh, and so we certainly want to be coupling um, the wide centre lines with that lower speed limit. And it's actually a very good initiative that uh, in situations where there's something different on the road, like a wide centre line, uh, people perhaps appreciate this is a different road environment, perhaps a higher risk one. And so we also tend to see uh, a higher level of compliance with those lower speed limits. So I think this is a really uh, useful initiative. Uh, perhaps the way it's been led on, in rural roads in Queensland on this issue, uh, where they're seeing some quite good results from coupling lower speeds with wide yes. centre lines. Uh, but certainly also in the urban context, um, we can do the same. We can put in place uh, wide centre lines, um, uh, flush medians, or painted medians, uh, and aim towards perhaps a, a lower speed environment. Yeah, no, that's true. Fantastic. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Neil, for the question. And just uh, in the interest of um, keeping to our time limit today, we might move on to the case study, if we may, and uh, we'll address some more questions at the end, perhaps. Would that Excellent. be okay? Yes. Fantastic. Great. Okay. Well, let's get into it. So uh, the case study is a road uh, that actually is about 500 metres from where we're sitting, uh, just uh, in front of Barb. Uh, it is a major urban arterial, 80 kilometer speed limit. It's on a downhill run, downhill grade, um, from left to right. And it has a, um, a collector road, a sort of a moderate level local road, um, with uncontrolled right turning vehicles. Uh, this um, location has been identified as a black spot, as a cluster of uh, casualty crashes in the past. Um, not particularly outstanding one, but nevertheless one that was on the radar of the road agency uh, for some uh, improvements. So, very important uh, in applying the safe system assessment framework is to do a baseline case. So, uh, project is being developed. Why? Because we have. What is the problem? Let's do some analysis. So, this is the assessment of the baseline. Uh, conditions. So moving from the top left corner, um, I can sort of make a, a few statements about choices made uh, in scoring it. So yes, it's a high volume road, it's about 40 something thousand vehicles a day, um, so four out of four, it's relatively high for that, uh, for that um, road stereotype. Uh, likelihood of runoff road crashes, yeah, it's a steep grade, uh, we know that's a factor. Um, it does have a deceleration lane for left turners, so that's that's a little bit good. That's a it's a plus. Um, there's a there is an intersection there. Again, that's a association with uh, with runoff road crashes and lots of other types. There are no shoulders, no silt shoulders, uh, cabin channel, and there are moderate clear zones. So there, there are not too many roadside hazards in that area. The, the, there are some trees, but they're fairly young and uh, we. we thought of like uh, frangible at this point in time and there are no barriers. So it's a three out of four. So it's not tragic but it's definitely not good. Um, speed, well uh, high speed yes, um, 80 possibly higher. Uh, we had some uh, speed surveys available to us. I think the operating speed was uh, 85 or something like that. Um, yep, severity if there is a crash with a roadside hazard uh, it will be uh, severe, there is no uh, separation. Um, also the steep grade adds to severity potentially and um, there are poles and trees uh, that can be hit. So three out of four, you know, if, if it was a, uh, a, a forest of large trees probably would be a, a four out of four, but it's not so bad. So three out of four. Um, I might pick another one just to go through. Intersection obviously, interse intersection crash type is obviously of, of concern here. Um, and you can see that um, it scores highly on exposure, mainly because of the high volume in Bellwood Highway. Uh, there are moderate traffic volumes coming out of Terrara Road, which is the side road. Um, there is a high percentage of turning movements. Um, there are a reasonable number of uh, conflict points at that intersection because uh, there are many lanes, many through lanes, so a turning vehicle has to give way to about three different lanes of traffic, so that's a, a negative thing. Uh, it's a high speed which promotes error. There is uh, 
poor side distance that was specific to uh, people doing U-turns. Um, this came out of a site inspection, uh, but they were protected 10 lanes, so I gave it a 3 out of 4. And again, in severity at 80 kilometers an hour, you've, you've seen those uh, S curves for uh, severity uh, and likelihood of death at 80 kilometers an hour, a turning crash uh, would be uh, almost certain to be, uh, well, very high probability of, of uh, death. So um, I won't go through all of them, uh, but you can see that the key at the bottom in the product lane, um, we, we have the, the highest scores are for intersection crashes uh, and for runoff road crashes and also other, which is mainly rear enders. So this is very typical um, of, of an intersection and, and to be honest would uh, generally uh, represent how uh, casualty crashes and, and severe crashes are split uh, in, in Melbourne area would be, at the intersections would be mainly cross uh, in, uh, crashes uh, followed by run of road and uh, rear enders. Okay, um, the assessment of other pillars, uh, we recognize there were many elderly drivers because there's a, a, a retirement village just almost almost immediately next to this intersection, just a little, little bit down the road, quite a large retirement village. Um, the downhill grade might cause tendency to, tendency to speed, which is actually observable on the site. Um, there were no particularly uh, vehicle um, concerns in there. It's not a not not a particularly heavy vehicle route. It's not. It's just a general uh, urban uh, arterial. Um, in terms of post crash care, we thought that was quite quite good. In in fact, in crashes that that we witnessed here from uh, from our workplace, we we have seen. Um, uh, emergency vehicles being able to store on medians and in service lanes to to do their work, so it's a it's a pretty good score on uh, post crash care. Okay, a case study. So this is the project. Um, now we've evaluated a number of different um, um, pro propositions for this uh, for the treatment here. This is probably one of the most uh, severe, most uh, sort of invasive, but essentially it involves uh, closing the median, closing the intersection almost, except allowing left in and left out uh, turns. So it is uh, it is pretty close to safe system, um, not not quite there, but as far as intersections go, it's a reasonably good um, approach. So how does it score? So in this slide in red, you can see the the key changes. So we've got, for intersection crashes, we've got a reduction in exposure. Uh, in this case, we're able to do this uh, by moving uh, majority of uh, turning vehicles um, to a nearby location where there are traffic signals. So, and this was, uh, you know, fortunate that this is possible. It's a few hundred meters away, but there are two large intersections where some of the traffic could go and utilize uh, heavily regulated turning uh, movements. Um, likelihood of crashes for intersection um, uh, crashes is reduced because there are no turning movements. So again, reduction in score down to one. Now, the scores are one because it's not completely eliminated. There's still left in, left out turns possible. Um, severity, well, severity hasn't changed, but there are fewer Conf uh, the, the, sorry, the conflict angles are reduced, so if a crash between a through and a turning vehicle occurs, it is at a much lower angle. We know from our analysis that these, uh, this sort of arrangement reduces the severity of intersection crashes quite substantially. Now, you can see that the total score went down from 48 previously to 3. That, that is a substantial uh, improvement. Now, I won't go through other uh, crashes just for brevity, but you can see that the uh, score reduced to overall score reduced to 85, which previously was I think 100, uh, oh, well over 100. Uh, so we've got a uh, I think it's 170 something. So we've got about a 50 percent reduction in uh, in the risk. Now, like I said before, let's not put too much weight into the total score. It's really about in understanding how the risk changes for individual crash types. And you can see that uh, uh, it has improved quite
quite a bit for intersection and head-on and for a run of road. Just before we move off, Chris, I think we're about to ask questions. Just one more thing to point out there is that the um, per column we're multiplying here, so it's a product at the bottom. Now, if any of those risks in the rows are zero, because it's multiplicative, the total risk becomes zero. So I think this demonstrates a really key point in regards to safe system solutions, and that is we can do one of three things. We can eliminate death and serious injury through exposure, through likelihood or through severity or a combination of them. But if any of those become zero, then there will be no risk. So I think that's actually quite a good uh, prompt for us when we are looking at the risks and also the solutions. Exactly. That's, thank you for pointing that out. Okay. So questions. Question time. All right. Brendan sent through a, a bit of a comment here. So he's saying with reference to the case study treatment option, uh, he's very pleased um, that um, you chose the medium crossing, or that the, sorry, <laughs> that the medium crossing option was recommended rather than reducing the main road speed and or introducing uh, traffic signals, although I assume that an alternative route is available. Mm. Correct, yes, yes. 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 Uh, about 200 metres up the road, it's quite a major intersection with quite good quality uh, turning facilities. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you, Brendan. Another question here from uh, David. So David's asking, is the assessment matrix considered useful for RSA processes? Uh, good question, and I'll come on to that response uh, uh, very soon, uh, soon because that's actually one of the, the next steps I want to talk about. So I'll just hold aside that, that question. Mm. Fantastic. All right. Uh, one more question here from Dimitri. So Dimitri's asking, um, where is the driver's alertness and emergency response considerations within the assessment? Hmm. Oh, okay. Um, no, it's, look, I think the key thing here is that there are prompts here to consider these issues, and I think that's one of the things that's different about this approach. Uh, we are prompting, and there are some questions in there to help us think about things like alertness, um, and that list perhaps will grow through use. We'll understand more issues that perhaps need to be included as prompts. Uh, previously, that wouldn't have been included perhaps as any assessment by uh, people uh, looking at these sorts of sites. So uh, in this case, um, we didn't see any issues relating to alertness. Uh, we could be wrong there. This is a major route into a city. People may have been driving for a long distance. So, you know, in some circumstances, people may have thought this to be a bit of an issue, uh, or there may be distractions or other things, uh, although not seen in this location. But look, I think it's a good comment that you know these are the sorts of things that have been missing in the past. And what we're doing here is providing prompts so people do consider these issues, uh, and we can actually uh, aim to address them if they are there. Fantastic. Thank you for those questions. And uh, I, yep, sorry, we're running out of time, I'm afraid, but we've got a few more slides to cover. So we might uh, just go through those. Blair and Chris, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just three more slides and then hopefully some time for some last questions. But look, I think just in summary, it is uh, a useful and a, a new approach and it does provide prompts across the key risk types, key crash types, uh, and across the, the pillars. Uh, it does break the problem down into manageable uh, bite-sized pieces, which I think uh, perhaps is what's been missing in the past. Um, and certainly this uh, information around the appropriate treatments, this tr treatment hierarchy is, is a new approach as well. Um, some of the issues in terms of where to next, we are looking at um, a, a, quanti uh, a qualitative approach uh, as it stands currently, but we have actually future-proofed this, and we, we are able to actually quantify some of these elements. And already we can perhaps put in information about the exposure, which is you know, quite, um, quite exacting. Uh, but in terms of the likelihood and severity, that's a little bit harder. I won't go into the details of what this, this IRAP and NRAM and XQMX is, but these are all approaches where we can actually uh, take information and put it within this framework, which actually do quantify things like likelihood and severity. So mm -hmm. that's certainly the direction that we want to move in with this framework, and particularly uh, useful for those bigger projects. The other point there is what projects, and there was quite a large working group involved in this uh, project, made up of practitioners and road agency staff. And the framework's already been used by those uh, people involved, uh, already exposed to the, the, the project, uh, and includes uh, cycling projects, um, option selection uh, at locations, but also discussion around policy issues like speed limits, uh, heavy vehicle uh, safety related issues as well. So I think really the sky's the limit here and we're still at early days and I think we'll sort of uh, try to capture some of these uh, applications over time 
uh, and then perhaps reflect that back to, to people and, and show how this might be actually be used in, in reality. But certainly a very wide uh, uh, range of applications already, uh, right through from small scale uh, black spots through to um, you know hundreds of millions of dollar uh, scale projects. So there is um, a, a wide range of uh, possible applications here. Yeah. Could we use this for operational projects? Things and that don't involve infrastructure changes, but just uh, the way that uh, traffic flow is managed. Look, exactly. I think this is what we'd like to see. We had certainly, um, uh, you know, the network operations experts on the team, and they also saw um, potential for those sorts of issues to be addressed through this matrix. And we'd certainly like to see applications and and learn from that experience as part of this this bit of work. Uh, the earlier question about road safety audit, uh, and certainly there's a strong crossover here. Uh, will this replace a road safety audit? We, we don't know. Um, we perhaps would look at some sort of convergence over time. Road safety audits still play a very uh, important role, uh, but perhaps in the past they have missed out some of these broader issues, and some people may have been doing these sorts of assessments as part of an audit process anyway. That they may have been looking at some of these uh, other pillars as part of their work. And so I, I do see perhaps, um, not in the short term, but perhaps in the, the three, four, five year horizon that this may start to converge with a, a road safety audit approach. Uh, and that's uh, still to be uh, determined, I guess. The last point there is where do I find out more information? And um, the, the key bit of uh, uh, reference is this uh, new report from Ostroads. And I'll show you the website uh, in a moment where this is available. Uh, this report takes you through the different uh, uh, steps in the process. Uh, it talks through a number of different case studies and how this uh, has been applied. The other interesting and useful part of this report, though, is there's quite a large appendix on the safe system approach, particularly as it applies to infrastructure. So pretty much our state of uh, knowledge in terms of safe systems is, is captured in, in this report. And look, my last slide is where to go for further information. The bottom uh, web address, the ostroads.com.au, is, is where you'll find this report. Uh, it's free to download. Uh, I would certainly recommend that you look at that and uh, come back to us with any questions or comments. Uh, and certainly we're embedding this in our operation. Uh, road agencies are doing the same. I uh, would welcome your feedback and thoughts on how it could be used or, or even ways that it might be improved. Uh, but also certainly encourage you to keep your eyes open for further uh, webinars where we're actually going to talk perhaps a bit about this in a more practical sense and how it might be applied. Uh, we'd certainly welcome your suggestions on uh, future webinars. Uh, and so I'd point you towards the ARB website there, arb.com.au, where there is a page uh, around our webinars and what's what's coming up in the, in the near future in, in that space. So look, I, th I think we've probably got time for a quick couple of questions, Angela. Absolutely. So um, Paul's just asking um, if there's an Excel table available of this matrix. Now, am I right in saying it's just in the in the report and it can be taken from there or what? Yeah, look, it's a good point and uh, someone else has asked a similar question. So uh, it's not actually part of the report itself. There's a, a stylized uh, appendix with a blank matrix. Um, but actually, some people, when they applied this, did develop up a matrix through a, an Excel spreadsheet. So, look, I'd certainly welcome your uh, emails, and I can send through just a, a quick um, uh, Excel spreadsheet. And look, maybe in, into the future, this becomes a bit more of a, um, a useful tool, where there's actually embedded in a, a tool or a website or a, yeah. an Excel spreadsheet these solutions as well. So, uh, if there's enough demand for that, certainly there's um, perhaps scope to, to approach Ostroads again about some funding to, to develop that up as well. Let's let's watch the demand for this and see how people are applying it, and and then uh, maybe even uh, you know uh, grow this uh, progressively into the future. Absolutely. All right. Um, thank you very much for that. We've had a few comments about um, the presentation being an excellent one. So thank you, gentlemen, for your time to present it today. I um, might finish up with a question here from Sandra because I I think uh, this one might be applicable to quite a few people in our audience. Um, how much cost does this process typically add to the project? Yeah. Um, you know, she's gone on to say that clients or their clients are typically very cost focused, and I, I suspect this is probably a common theme. Yeah. Do you have any, any thoughts or insight? I think we we've sort of can reflect on the experience during the the, the project. Uh, uh, generally, uh, it was a fairly quick uh, process with maybe two or three people who were familiar with the project already. Um, and they were able to turn around from within, what, half an hour to maybe, yeah. maybe an hour? I think so, half an hour to an hour, um, and that's just really for a quick assessment. Yeah. 
and that might be appropriate based on your budgets and the type of project you're dealing with. And uh, but the other alternative is that you might have a very large infrastructure project, and and certainly we applied this to one state where there was uh, a very very large um, funding application about to go forward. Uh, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars here, and we spent a full day with a full team of people running through a workshop and and then subsequent work following that as well. So it really is a scalable approach, I think. Uh, and you know if you're talking about just uh, limited budget context that could be done very quickly um, and you know uh, give you a, a reasonable result. Indeed, yeah. Um, just to add to that, um, uh, one of the, f the the first step in applying the, uh, the the framework is to look at the the depth and scope of the assessment. Um, so at that point, you really set down and, and document what you want to do with this, whether it's going to be a five minute appraisal or whether you're going to look at uh, a whole road project, break it down into uh, minute elements and then do assessment on every single element, you know, segments or intersections or so on. So it's really up to the user and, and up to the client um, and in that way it's extremely scalable, which is a, one of the objectives of the, of the project. Indeed. Fantastic. All right, we have had um, uh, Osroads have sent through the direct link to the, the project report, which is fantastic. Thank you for that. And to all of you tuned in today, if you keep an eye on your email, I'll send you through that direct link, as well as the recording of today's session and uh, any relevant presentation materials. So uh, on that note, I bid you all farewell. Thank you so much for tuning in today for this presentation. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, we do apologize for not being able to address all of the questions today. It's always fantastic when we get a high volume but we, we have sadly run out of time. Please do get in touch with us uh, if there is anything else that um, we, you know, we can assist you with after the webinar has concluded. Blair Chris, always a pleasure working with you. Thank you so much for your time and uh, no doubt we'll see you on more webinars in the future to come. Indeed. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Bye-bye.